What's up, YouTube? I'm back again with another topic review for the uh, Data Science Flex program at the Flat Iron School. If you're new to this channel uh, or this series in particular, I uh, am a student at the coding boot camp called Flat Iron School in their data science program currently. I'm in phase three of five. Uh, there's about 10 modules per phase, so for, as a new kind of study practice, uh, for phase three, I'm blogging about each module as I finish it and kind of reviewing and sharing my understanding of the content covered. So uh, before we get going forward, my disclaimer, always throw, I'm not doing this on behalf or for Flatiron. Uh, I don't necessarily know that they, I mean, some of the people at Flatiron know I do this, but Flatiron as an organization is not aware of like me blogging on their behalf or anything like that so i use some of their uh like examples and a little bit of their content cherry picked from the curriculum uh and some like graphics and things like that so uh most everything that you find in the notebook uh if you follow the github link uh down below is going to be stuff like from the flat iron curriculum or like maybe my wording of stuff from the flat iron curriculum so with that out of the way today we're Reviewing module 24, uh, which is all about regularization, uh, in, which is really just a fancy way, or it's a particular way of optimizing your, uh, your, your machine learning model. Uh, before I get going with that, I wanted to mention, this is my first video I'm recording as a 26 year old. I just had a birthday a couple days ago. And one of the things I did for my birthday was I upgraded my desk setup here a little bit. So uh, I'm going to show you guys that right now real quick. So let me turn my background blur off also. Yeah. So um, I, I've had this shelf here all the time, but I had a mini fridge that was here that I wasn't using any, uh, anymore. And this bookshelf you see was over here right now I've got a whole lot of nice empty wall uh, which I've actually been using for like uh, handstand push-ups and that sort of thing but my computer used to be computer section um down here on my desk which was kind of cool um but you'll also notice I have a surface book too so I have this kind of flipped backwards so the screen's a little bit more towards me so that's it was down here and that takes up a lot of space from my desk right uh, even though I like having the wireless like keyboard and mouse it's super nifty but anyway so I moved the what's it called mini fridge out of the way just completely out of here not use anymore move my bookshelf over here uh, and so I was able to slide my desk this way so the shelf instead of being on the left side of the desk is in the center now so now I can just sit here right in the center of my desk and my computer is at uh, pretty much eye level and that's uh, supposed to help with productivity instead of having your head sort of tilted straight ahead or slightly upward as opposed to tilted downward it tends to make you a little bit drowsy so uh, it's a little messy right now because i got like my mic and everything out here i really need to come up with a better uh, solution for for my microphone but it's nice i like it there's everything's got like there's no clutter there's no like loose papers or pens or anything laying around there's like six different things uh, that I can pick up, dust it, and go. I did a little bit of cable management down here as well. That um, power source for my computer kept kicking it all the time. So I Velcroed it to the wall uh, as well as the power strip. Um, you can see I rest my feet on the wall back there quite a bit. But yeah, so uh, first episode with this new desk setup and also first episode whoops, as a... Uh, a 26 year old so that's exciting Doo -doo -doo. there we go cool uh, and now the camera is on a little bit of more like the same plane or level um, try to get it framed correctly there we go um, as like the computer screen so I just kind of have to glance back and forth to like talk to you guys versus looking at my computer um, so yeah so with that all out of the way, now we can get into the, the curriculum and the interesting fun stuff. So as usual, I got my one pager that you can't read because of the background blur, but we've got um, mean squared error, uh, residual sum of squares, uh, object-oriented programming, a lot of things from a lot of different modules 
um, that come back up in this module this week. Uh, and as you can see, it's a fairly short list, longer list than last time though. I'm really struggling to get this in this on the screen. Maybe I'll just make that the JPEG. I don't know. Um, but the back, the back of it's like all uh, filled up, right? So uh, if you watched it before, you know the drill. We're gonna move now over to the Jupyter notebook. Uh, so we're talking module 24, topic review today. There's two kind of broad topics that this module covered, um, which was kind of weird. This, this, this particular module seemed like they were just kind of throwing in a few like extra things like at the end of like a larger point being made. Um, and that's, so there was like practical skills that I gathered like w under this model optimization stuff. And then they kind of seemingly like somewhat randomly kind of just threw out this like uh stuff which this is like just kind of standard practices in the industry and like uh, the data science industry and understanding that sort of stuff so um that got me thinking that i might start doing instead of uh topic reviews for each individual module over like everything in the module maybe zeroing in on like one or two like more interesting things from that module in the future um, I don't know, but today we're just going to keep going uh, forward as we have been and just do our best uh, to talk about everything that went, was covered in the module. So first, I'll talk a little bit about these model optimization methods and techniques, and then we'll wrap things up with talking a little bit about data science processes. So we've got our kernel up and running. We're going to import all of our packages. Not a lot of code um, this episode either. Uh, a lot of the stuff covered today is like, the way to code it isn't really different than anything else that I've covered before. Um, so it seemed to make more sense to more like cover like the like conceptual side of things. Um, so yeah. So real quick, straight out the, j uh, the gate, we're just gonna talk about a few cool things available to generate data um why would you want to generate data right as opposed to like actually gathering like real world data like actual observations from the real world real world um to kind of prototype different data science pipelines for example or just see how different algorithms behave with different types of data that might give you, you know, better, stronger intuition on what type of algorithm to use to the real data that you're using. Uh, there's all sorts of things um, to make simulated data for. Um, so these are just like a few scikit-learn tools that make that uh, available to you. So uh, if you look in, if you find, if you go to the GitHub and you look at the link uh, on this index, the IPYMB file, these all are hyperlinked to these docs for these particular functions from scikit-learn uh, and these all come from the scikit-learn data sets module so you're going to from sklearn.datasets import whichever one of these you're wanting to use um, and they all they're all pretty self-explanatory um, so this creates clusters like blobs of data you can make circles moon shapes uh, you can make a regression line like of data points um, and there's all sorts of parameters and whatnot that you can manipulate. So let's go like here and let's look at our uh, parameter suggestions. So we have like our number of samples, um, shuffle. So if you have like multiple samples and you can like shuffle them, uh, how much noise you want to have in your data. So that's going to affect like your error term, obviously. Um, the, your the random state so that's if you want to like reproduce the exact same data points you can set a random state uh, returns an x and a y which uh, your y is going to be it says array of uh, in samples and then your x or it says array of in samples two so uh, now that I'm reading that that's actually the first time I've read this particular portion of the docs your y is going to be like a vector right because it's going to be like a data series a single column right and x could be a single or multiple uh features which is why it's capitalized and why l is uh, not 
Uh, so anyway, we're just using the make moons uh, function here, but these all work the same. They all have pretty much the same parameters that you can pass in. Um, we're declaring our data frame, uh, providing a little color dictionary for matplotlib to color code everything right down here. Uh, and we're, so we have three different clusters, if you will, or groups of this data. So, uh, or actually, I think in this example, there's only going to be two. But you'll see. So we're going to iterate through each of those groups, and we're all going to plot them on the same axes. Yep. So, yeah, that's my bad. Not that it made a difference, but it was bothering me. So you can see we have these like moon shapes of like data points, and you can figure how like that would. Um, you could you like just like a simple like purpose where you just practice uh, fitting a line uh, to this to this data or classifying the data because there's clearly like two different groups. Um, all sorts of uh, purposes for it. So this next get away from me. Uh, this next cell is an example of how you would use this for um, performing a linear regression. So this is showing you how different amounts of noise, remember I like mentioned earlier that would affect your error term, how that's affecting your regression line, your best fit regression line that is. Uh, so that's just one example of how you could see how different data distributions will affect your actual like uh, model predictions without having to actually gather real world real world data uh, so yeah that's pretty much that for data generation um, not a whole lot of like just riveting stuff here just like the fact that these functions exist is kind of the big point um, which is pretty cool they're pretty nifty little functions that you can play with so what most of this module was really like about, or the big thing to really take away from it was penalized estimation and everything regarding it. Uh, one of these days I'm gonna figure out how to make that not happen. So penalized estimation basically is when you're estimating your co feature or parameter coefficients um, you're, you're penalizing the model for uh, over complexity or overfitting. What the, the point of penalized estimation is, is to prevent overfitting from occurring. So there's a couple different ways you can do that, uh, at least that we talked about in this module. They are a ridge regression and a lasso regression. Uh, and all the calculus is here. Um, we're not gonna go much into how to like uh, really into like the, how to code these models together because they the, the syntax or the code and everything itself and the, like the pre-processing for the pre-processing for the data all that sort of stuff is pretty one for one with like a linear regression you're just calling like a different function you're just making a different function call um you're, you're calling you know ridge regression or or lasso instead of linear regression um, but the calculus is here, and so you'll notice some like similarities, right? So this is our cost function, so that's our observed data point minus our predicted data point, and we're taking the square of that, uh, and that is equal to this, which is like reminiscent of the um, y equals mx plus b, but now our y is on the other side of the, like, the equatorial symbol here. Um, We've seen this before where y hat is represented as uh, mx of i plus b. Uh, and then we're squaring that same as here. So that's our like normal cost function um, for just like a simple linear regression. For uh, ridge regression, which is also referred to as L2 norm regularization, whatever that means. Um, but if you ever see that, it's talking about a ridge regression. Is similar, so we're still taking the square of the difference of our observed and our predicted data points, right? But we're incorporating this penalty term into things, the lambda uh, expression here. And the specific calculus on this changes a bit when you include multiple predictors. Um, 
so you're basically for ridge regression you're going to have like let me see if i can highlight this correctly whoops i can't click on it because then you're gonna not be able to read it um so everything you see from this sigma to the other side of this sigma here if you have multiple predictors uh you're only going to have this one sigma that's all going to be enclosed in parentheses basically and you're going to add it up for each um parameter that you have you know to the to the nth degree basically similar to the uh, addition rule with derivatives <clears throat> um, so lasso regression is similar to ridge regression but it's different in the fact that uh, lasso regression will so ridge regression the reason it's penalized estimation is because it reduces some of the uh, parameter coefficients based on like how many parameters there are and uh, like if you have any like parameters that are particularly uh, large or something so um, there's a lot being packed into that little like lambda symbol right uh, there right the difference being uh, that you take the absolute value of uh, your penalty turn times m your parameter uh, with your lasso regression and what that does is it makes it so that instead of just reducing uh, some or all coefficients, uh, parameter coefficients, you're doing that, but maybe you're also bringing some of them to like entirely to zero. So, um, so you can see here, like if X equals zero, then M times X equals M times zero, which is all uh, equals zero. So, uh, which that effectively eliminates some features, right? If you bring the, the coefficient to zero then whatever whatever the parameter is that you're multiplying it by it's going to come out as zero um, so that's the big difference is they're both penalized ways of penalized estimation they both include the penalty term lambda but lasso regression also uh, has the embedded function uh, uh, feature or function of it that um, I don't want to like use the words feature and function like out of context here too much um, Lost my train of thought. Lasso regression also eliminates some features because it makes some features equivalent to zero, which is the same as eliminating them entirely. Um, so that's your big difference between lasso and ridge regression. They both re uh, penalize the 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 of the model for like over complexity and overfitting and that sort of thing. Um, these are both available in Scikit-Learn in the linear m linear underscore model module. Uh, you call them just like you would like a, a, uh, a linear regression or any other kind of like model um, object in scikit-learn. So this is one of those things that just seemed like it kind of like got randomly like thrown in there into the curriculum, but it was interesting nonetheless. Um, so there's this thing called AIC and BIC, which came after. Um, it stands for Akaiki, I think is how you pronounce this name. Akaiki is information criterion, and BIC is the Bayesian information criterion. So Akaiki's information criterion came out, big success, and the Bayesian statisticians were like, no, 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 we want to have our own, uh, and they came up with the Bayesian information criterion. And the basic difference there, what makes the BIC Bayesian, um, is the fact that it it incorporates historical probabilities into calculating like the, the future ones so these are the, this is the calculus for it this ln uh, if you don't know means natural log um which i probably don't have any business talking on like the mathematics of that so google it uh but anyways this is the formula to calculate your aic or your bic uh K is the amount of parameters that you have, so how many features are in your spreadsheet, basically, minus your target variable column. Um, L hat is the maximum value of the likelihood function for your model. So one of the things that uh, makes AIC and BIC so easy to use, which they, what they would be used for is uh, evaluating if one model is better or worse than the other, basically. Um, they're easy to use because they're automatically calculated sorry, the, the likelihood function for the model is automatically calculated when you build the model. 
Uh, so it doesn't necessarily require any extra computation uh, in order to perform this analysis, as opposed to, like, say, gradient descent or something, which um, uh, or like fitting a regression line, which can get pretty computationally expensive. N is the number of observed data points, like as usual. Um, so you can see here that they're the Bayesian one. They're just incorporated in the natural log of the number of data points times the length of the parameter space. Um, somehow or another that incorporates previous probabilities or historical probabilities into the uh, calculus. Probably not important as a data scientist on your day-to-day -day to really understand like be able to like you know do by hand like all the math behind there. It's just important to understand basically that if you have two models uh, in whether you're looking at AIC or BIC whichever one has a lower AIC or BIC score is going to be the better model to use. Cool. So that's uh, penalized estimation and a Kaiki and Bayesian's information criterion. Uh, so now we're going to look at different feature selection methods. So at this point in the curriculum, things started to sort of, uh, let me see what time we're at, 20 minutes? Okay, not bad. Uh, things started to kind of all these like different things we're learning seem to start to be coming together into like a coherent uh, framework, All right? So the first feature selection method that you have, whoops, available to you is of course domain knowledge. Uh, so these are just this is there's kind of like um, earlier with the what was it model, the data generation. Not a whole lot of like riveting stuff here. Um, it's just important to not just be good at the math and the programming, but also like understand on a qualitative level the uh, sort of ins and outs of whatever the domain is that you're doing data science within, right? So that can be as simple as staying up to date with the most recent literature. Uh, and I would argue that that's important for not even like the unique domain of like whatever product or service you're like contributing towards in your data science work, but probably also um, on data science itself. There's a lot of research, like new research in data science, and we're learning new stuff literally every day. So uh, it's probably important to stay up to date on the literature for your particular domain you're working within, but also the domain of data science itself. Because um, you never know when like some cool new algorithm uh, might come out that has been exactly what you have been needing. Uh, communication with stakeholders. So it's really important to, when you're working as a data scientist, like communicate with your stakeholders and kind of get an idea of like, what are they expecting? What, like, what are the, not just like the, the deliverables that they want, but like, what do they want to get out of like the deliverables? What are the, what's like the real, like end result? What's the difference that they're wanting like you to make? And that's going to give you a good idea about kind of how to go about your data science procedures. Um, expert opinions, of course, because uh, you, as a, you know, data science is inherently multidisciplinary. So as much as you might stay up to date with the domain specific literature, you're not going to be as uh, with it as somebody who that's like the thing that they do. Um, so talking to experts and, you know, getting just like a better lay of the land um, in that sense, just talking to other people that just know more uh, than you about the specific domain you're working within. Listening to end users is um, one that I threw in there uh, because it's like important to, so like an example with, I really hate to be advertised to, like I loathe being advertised to. Um, every time an ad pops up on, on, on YouTube, even I like, I uh, roll my eyes in the back of my head. On TikTok, they've gotten pretty nifty with it in a way that doesn't actually bother me. They're actually like forming ads in a way People on TikTok are making ads in a way that you don't really realize it's a, it, realize that it's an ad quite at first. It's because it's not some like you know hundred thousand dollar commercial they put together. It's uh, like just some TikTok, and that doesn't bug me as much. And um, I think that some marketer somewhere along the way started talking to like the end users, the consumers of advertising content, and you know being like. What make what do you not like and what do you like about advertisements? And they probably came to that idea. Um, so yeah, it's just important I think to understand like like the end users. Like if you're you know trying to optimize some product, what do the end users of the current iteration of the product? What do they like about it? What do they not like about it? Um, 
you know, stuff like that. Uh, and many projects, of course, like, so, uh, role play developer and user, etc. What is that? Oh, so like when you're doing a project, you know, like, um, started like a little mini project, like just for the sake of learning, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to invent like the next like Jarvis or whatever. Right. But do a project that, you know, is going to like never be anything that somebody actually wants to like use, but, uh, but you'll still learn something from it. And then you get to like, you know, think about things in the, uh, you know, from the standpoint of a developer or a technical person in general, uh, you could once you've done and uh, and you've like created the thing from your project, then you can like use it as an end user and see what you like and don't like about it. Um, and that's going to give you a lot of insight uh, on the sort of human experience side of the domain that you're working within, I think. So there's domain knowledge, uh, and we have wrapper methods, which um, this is uh, an example. This would be like recursive feature elimination, which I used ad nauseum along with step by selection in my phase two project. Um, basically, what wrapper methods are is they're, they're however, what, whatever medium they, you know, come in, uh, they're subsetting different sets of the features available, the predictor variables uh, available in the model and figuring out what's the best combination of those features. By actually taking a subset of features, building a model and then looking at the statistics and the scores on that model, like your R squared value, for example, um, or uh, or your coefficient level or like whatever, right? Um, problem is the wrapper methods are very computationally expensive because you have to build a model for every, uh, iteration or every like subset of those features which you know if you talk about like you have n features and you're dealing with n factorial like subsets of those features you have a lot of models to build in the first place and then you have to fit the regression line like for every single one of those models um so that gets pretty impractical pretty quick especially when you're dealing with large amounts of features for one um and you know large uh, amounts of like observations as well so wrapper methods, time, place, for everything, but I wouldn't, the part of the problem that I realize now in my phase two project is I relied on wrapper methods a little bit too much, and that's part of why things took so long. You might, if you're watching those live streams, you might remember me having cells that would run for 45, 90 seconds, four minutes at a time. Uh, was not, totally not having a good time. Uh, so filter methods are uh, a little more computationally efficient than wrapper methods um, so basically what a filter method is is you're coming up with some sort of threshold for like I used in my last project variance inflation factor uh, and multicollinearity so I just kind of arbitrarily said anything beyond this threshold we're throwing it out um, that helped a lot that kind of reduces the amount of models that need to be made you still need to like build and train and test like some amount of models but you don't need to do it for like every single subset of features uh, the way you do with wrapper methods so in my last project i used kind of a combination of wrappers and filters uh, predominantly for my feature selection uh, the embedded methods are um, methods where the feature is selected or eliminated through some some aspect that's intrinsic to the model uh, itself or the algorithm that builds the model itself right uh, so a great example of embedded feature selection is the lasso and ridge algorithms maybe ridge not so much because that's really just penalized estimation but lasso uh, for sure because like I said earlier with lasso some of the feature coefficients might be reduced completely to zero which mathematically eliminates those features uh, so that's and that's not based on variance inflation factor or subsetting features and looking at r squared or like any of that um, it's just intrinsic to the the algorithm itself that the model is built with um, so that's probably i don't know for sure because I'm, I'm not a computer scientist i'm a data scientist um, that might be the most computationally like cost effective method um, because it's like you build a model and you're getting your feature selection all at the same time that said there's time and place for everything 
Um, so all of these things you should really, uh, that's kind of where data science becomes art or whatever, uh, is like understand having an intuition for what's like the best balance uh, between all four of these things that you have available here for your feature selection. So that is it for um, model optimization topics. Uh, now we're going to talk about data science processes. I just, I'm going to write a letter to Microsoft and tell them VS Code notebooks are being dumb. So anyway, uh, there are several methodologies that have been standardized by the data science community to help us guide a sensible and efficient workflow for data science projects. Um, it's important to know that these are really guidelines and they're not strict rules and it's pretty common to kind of step in and out or backwards or forwards or whichever phase. Um, so I, my sense that I got when I was kind of reading through the, the curriculum was that it's what's really important isn't making sure that you go from one phase to the next directly um, in like a linear fashion. But what's really important is just uh, taking a moment to consider like and recognize like what phase are you in, right? Um, and that's going to help you, you know, better communicate to other people involved in the project, like what you're doing, what your like purposes and goals are for what you're doing, um, what like they could do to help other people that you're bringing into the project. It's just like, it's just important to be aware of like, what am I doing right now? And like, why am I doing it? What am I trying to get out of it? Right. Um, so these are just a few kind of standardized protocols, uh, that are common within the data science community. Uh, so this first one is CRISP DIEM, which stands for cross industry standard process for data mining. Data mining is a pretty old term. You don't hear that a whole lot anymore. Um, but what that specifically refers to is the portion of data science where you're trying to, um, the actual modeling portion where you're trying to detect like patterns and find like predictive relationships and that sort of thing. Uh, so you can see we begin with our business understanding here. That goes back to uh, our domain knowledge and communicating with stakeholders and that sort of thing. Um, data understanding, you understand, you got to like know like where you're getting the data from, like uh, how is it encoded, like what are all these like different, you know, uh, what, how many features do we have that are categorical? How many of them are... Um, it, within the categorical variables, which ones are nominal, which ones are ordinal, like um, stuff like that. So once you understand the, the data and the business that you uh, are using the data uh, in respect to, then you prepare your data. So this is where you're like, like dealing with missing values, maybe engineering new features. Um, yeah, everything that you pretty much, 90% of what you saw on the phase two project live streams. Um, encoding uh, data. So like I had like a, a column that was a bunch of dates and it was just like in strings and I wanted it to be like in a, encoded in a way that I could actually like cal do calculations with it. So I encoded it as a, a converted that column to like date time objects, stuff like that. Um, modeling is you know that you're you're building your model you're fitting your regression line you're and going back and you know selecting features optimizing it building your model again and so you can argue that feature selection is part of like your data preparation so you kind of go back and forth here there's they got a couple arrows here on purpose you go back and forth here pretty uh frequently and then once you get a model that you're happy with uh then you evaluate it and that's where you're actually like um as a data scientist, you're taking like all the numbers that got spit out and, you know, communicating them in a way that non-technical people can understand and make decisions and take actions with. Uh, deployment is, of course, the phase where you're actually taking actions and implementing like what you've learned into uh, uh, the product or service that you're uh, working on. I don't know a whole much about the deployment phase of things because I'm still a student and haven't actually worked as a data scientist yet, so I'm very excited to learn about that one day. 
Uh, this is what the, I thought that kind of, I don't know, like resonated with me the most, uh, knowledge discovery in databases. Uh, so first you have to select, like you have all this data available, which data are you going to use, right? Pre-processing is again, dealing with missing values, uh, and coding your data, like tra train test splitting, like, you know, like sampling for, uh, which data is your train data, which data is your test data, uh, all that sort of stuff, transfer forming your data, which um, is a lot of math stuff and basically makes it um, a little bit, your models a little bit better at uh, detecting patterns, which is the next phase, data mining. We're actually detecting what patterns and relationships exist in the data, what things predict other things, that sort of stuff. Uh, and then again, your interpretation evaluation phase is basically you taking your technical knowledge and using that along with the outputs of your model to communicate uh, worthy suggestions to your stakeholders. Get all this out of the way. And then OSIM, which, uh, as much as KDD, like I like it a little bit more. I have no idea why, just like completely a hunch thing. Uh, OSIM seems to be the most sort of like comprehensive one. Um, th these all kind of like, cover the same like things roughly so you obtain your data of course you scrub it that's pre-processing your data um, exploring your data so that's something that it the OSIM kind of incorporates that the others don't uh, I think it is like nice to like you know just kind of like explore your data like check out like you know uh, do your like data frame dot uh, describe and look at you know are there any is there anything with like really outrageous like standard deviations or means or you know, just whatever kind of like fun stuff. Um, so of course, uh, you build your models uh, and you interpret your models, right? Rather than like evaluate, uh, same thing, right? You're looking at what the output of your model is and you're using your technical knowledge combined with your communication skills to inform non-technical people about uh, what suggestions are being made uh, by the data. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is topic 24 of the Flatiron Data Science Bootcamp, or at least it's what I got out of topic 24 of the Flatiron Data Science Bootcamp. So uh, I hope you got something out of this. I hope, again, I've said this at least, I think in most videos at least, um, Calling this a boot camp is really kind of an understatement. We're learning a lot more here than just uh, how to code. Um, there was hardly any code in like this video today. Uh, for example, uh, it's important to know how to code, but it's like kind of like you. There's no point in knowing how to turn a wrench if you don't like understand the machine that you're going to turn the wrench on, right? Uh, so Flatiron, I have been really impressed with so far, has done a great job of. Uh, providing that kind of understanding of what you're coding about as well rather than just like here's the syntax of how to like write your code uh, so if you're on the fence about coding boot camp and um, you're seriously considering data science i would recommend seriously considering flatiron because as you can see here we're learning a lot of really cool stuff um, or if you're just generally interested in uh, data science period uh, i would i would look into flatiron so yeah, that's it for today. I will be back soon with another topic review for module 25. Uh, we're going over classification algorithms and stuff like that, uh, which is gonna be really cool because we're getting into um, using like regression lines that are not necessarily linear and stuff like that. So that's gonna be really cool. Uh, hope you enjoyed the video. Hope you got something out of it. Highly recommend Flatiron. Check out the description below for any relevant like links and that sort of cool stuff. And I'll see you guys next time. Peace.